Hey everybody, welcome back. It's lecture number 19. We're going to be talking about decision trees today. Hopefully we will be able to see both the forest and those individual trees, but uh, first let's get into a little bit of the nitty-gritty on logistics. So uh, I want to remind everybody that next week on Friday, December 4th, is going to be our guest lecture. Eugene Izhikevich, who's the CEO of Brain Corporation, Brain Corp, um, <clears throat> is going to be talking with us. So just as an FYI, Brain Corp is a giant autonomous robots mega machine company. They build all kinds of commercial robots for logistics and for cleaning, and they have a pretty interesting operation. So Eugene, I'm sure will give us a little bit of a tour of that, as well as answering your questions and maybe talking a little bit, I hope, about careers in machine learning. So uh, we also have a little bit after that, homework number six is already out, and the due date I set to Sunday. So Sunday at midnight, I gave you a couple of extra days, uh, both because I was didn't get it out at the beginning of Friday and because it just, you know, it's that time of year. I think you'll probably need the extra time, perhaps. Uh, and of course, also on the horizon is the final project. So you should be working on that. Uh, there is all kinds of stuff on Canvas to help you out. Uh, I want to particularly remind you about a couple of uh, Jupyter Notebooks that we put out. I put out one along with the last lecture, and uh, there's also one which is, uh, I came from Aparna, who put it out during discussion sections covering similar territory differently on how to do these kinds of cross-validation massive projects. Okay. I'm looking forward to Eugene's lecture. Let's see where we can go from there. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, decision trees. So we're going to start talking about trees today. And in fact, what you'll notice is that trees make an appearance in the Caruana uh, uh, et al. paper, OK? Um, so, as it sits here and talks about decision trees, right, two different kinds, and uh, I believe there's, oh yeah, boosted stumps as well, which we'll also be talking about stumps today, which as you might guess, are tiny little trees. And then random forests that are also a kind of tree learner, along with regular old decision trees. So uh, at this point, once I cover trees and random forests in the next lecture, then I think you will have a handle on all of these algorithms. So just as a reminder, what is the Caruana paper doing? Right? What, they're, what the paper tries to do is it takes a look at a bunch of different learning algorithms, and it operates those algorithms on a several different data sets and it tries to evaluate them with a selection of metrics what what it's going to do is it's going to try each one of those algorithm and um, data set combos multiple times looking at different subsets of the big data set for the training data and it's going to each time find the best optimal hyperparameters for each algorithm going to do that using cross-validation like we've talked about. And then it's going to go ahead and use the best version of those hyperparameters, train it on all of the training data, and test it on some holdout data. It's going to acquire that for every data set and uh, algorithm combo. And then it also does that with different metrics. It uses tech various techniques that you don't have to worry about with different metrics uh, to make those different metrics comparable with each other. So that's the, that's the whole calibration story there. Because we've only asked you to do a single metric, you don't have to get into that whole calibration stuff. All right, but then we take a look at what did best, which algorithms did best on which data sets, 
which algorithms did best overall across many data sets. I will note two things for you, right? There is a, an interesting theorem in machine learning. It's been around since actually, I think, before this paper called There is No Such Thing as a Free Lunch Theorem. That's uh, by Schmidt Huber. So that theorem states that there may be no such thing as the best algorithm. It's more like each algorithm is going to be better at some tasks and worse at others. And on average, across all possible tasks in the universe, they'll be about the same. Okay, so there's, there's no special magic, there's no free lunch, where just picking the right algorithm gets you sub super par or subpar performance on average. But of course, on each individual data set, there will be a winner or a loser. And maybe on classes of data sets, there could be, in addition, winners and losers. And that's what the Caruana paper is after. Okay? And that's what this kind of exercise is after with you guys. So when you do this, we want to train you both like, hey, this is how we do such a thing, and also get you thinking in this empirical mindset, okay? Because whichever problem you're facing, the best solution may not be what you feel like it is, okay? There may be a better solution, but once you've found a better solution, don't go around thinking, this is the solution, it's what I'm going to use from here on out. No, because for every given problem, for every given data set, you're going to have potentially a different winner. Um, and if you're really, really lucky, then a certain class of algorithm is mostly good most of the time on similar problems. And that's about the best you can hope for. That's why you'll always see papers out there doing this kind of empirical comparison. All right. That is the main paper. Oh, and like I was saying, the results on all this, they're informative, but not definitive, right? They are serving suggestions, to borrow a little bit of marketing speak. Uh, it's clear that there will be exceptions to this ordering of best models. So FYI, there is a follow-up paper uh, from 2008 by Caruana Nicole. Colescu Mazil maybe said something like that, and a third party. Um, and in this new one, they looked at a bunch more data sets. And these data sets are much bigger in number of variables. And they look at these data sets across multiple different uh, algorithms once again, trying to check out, you know, as we get large numbers of features which algorithms are doing the best on average. Um, so you may wish to check this out. The link is right here in the slides. And uh, I have more reservations about this paper than the 2006 one, mostly because when you look at the fact that they are trying to make statements about number of variables, they really generally only have a couple of uh, data sets in each quote number of variables. So it is, you know, maybe it's more the data set and the task than it is the number of variables. But hey, there's some smoothish results here that maybe speak to the fact that there are algorithms that do better on the upper end of number of variables. All right, so that is, oh yes, and the winners across all of this was largely things that we might guess, right? Things that are either uh, controllable in how they overfit, like random forests, which you haven't uh, encountered yet, or things that are known to have great expressive power, like neural networks, or things that we rather expect should do good in high dimensionality underfit situations like support vector machines. All right, now let us do our daily fun. So we're going to start off with decision stumps. Um, 
what is a decision stump? Well, it comes from the idea of decision trees, which we're going to address in just a minute. But let's start with the stump. So all a decision stump really is, is a classifier on one of your M features. So when you have M features, variables, or whatever you want to call them, what a decision stump looks for is it finds one of those that's discriminative, where I can just set a point up and down the scale of this feature, and it says everything above this is a positive class, everything below this threshold is a negative class. So the entire decision stump classifier system is just to find of your M variables, pick one, and then pick a threshold within that variable, which is going to optimally separate the two classes. Now, uh, since we're talking about classification, you might guess that training the decision stump is purely the 0-1 loss. Okay, So we've already established this pretty well by now. You should understand that. And what it's going to do is we're going to minimize the training error, finding both which which one of the j which one of the features so that's j okay so we're trying to estimate j star which feature and also what's a threshold so we're going to move both the across all the possible features and and all the possible thresholds and it's that latter which is kind of problematic because if we're doing continuous numbers so this feature is whatever it's height it's height and in inches that we end up picking it's a continuous number. It can be anything, any real number. There's a, literally an infinite number of such numbers. So the nature of decision stumps is to be solved with exhaustive search. So we have our training set. It's a set of features in real number land. And we have our binary decision output. And we have our decision threshold. And of course, we have to pick which feature it is. So let's imagine our features like this. Okay, So x1 and x2 are two features in this data set. Uh, we have our positive classes in the red and the negative classes in the black. So what the, what the learning algorithm is, is exhaustive search. We have to pick which one of the these guys we want. So Let's try, start with x1. Okay, we've got a threshold, and we're going to vary that threshold back and forth across the entire x1 space. And as we move it back and forth, we're going to check what the misclassification error is at every step of that movement. Okay, well, then we have to try the other direction. So we're going to try x2. There we go. And uh, we're going to sweep again in X2. Zing. OK. And recording the misclassification error completely along the way. Now, in a proper continuous space, we can't actually check every infinity along the line there. So there'll be some sort of stepping that's being happening in, in re, you know, real implementation. But still, this is fundamentally an exhaustive search with a very, very large number of possibilities. So maybe we step from, maybe the range we know is from minus 10 to 10, and we step by thousandths, okay? So we'll have uh, 20 thousandths, 20,000 individual steps on each axis. Hopefully we don't have too many axes, okay? Okay, so once again, what we're doing is we're doing an argmin, and the pseudocode to do this would be a loop over the axes, j equal 1 to m, and then a loop for all reasonable values of a threshold back and forth, and we're going to compute that epsilon and pick the one that is the lowest at the end of it. Okay? So the decision stump is 
dumbly simple. The stump is dumb. Um, but it's a reasonable first try at a surprising number of things. Um, it's looking at only one feature and one feature only and finds the best threshold. So uh, it's actually, I disagree with this bullet point. Sorry, this is an inherited slide. I don't think it's efficient because in any reasonable number of dimensions, this is not computationally efficient, but it is certainly efficient to implement and easy to learn in low numbers of dimensions. Now, obviously the model itself is super, super simple and uh, that lends it to a bunch of other things where we can make decision stumps components in other bigger classifiers. So we can have a bunch of stumps and make an ensemble of out of them. And uh, that's a little preview of what's coming in the next few lectures. So the stump, what does it do? It just finds the best threshold of the best possible feature to separate two classes. It's a low complexity model. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I really should have edited this slide because it isn't computational complexity is not very low with the number of dimensions or the number of steps. So, uh, so it becomes useful for various things such as the Ada boost and KD tree, which We've already kind of seen the KD tree when we talked about K nearest neighbors and one of the algorithms for doing, uh, you know, nearest neighbors when there is a terribly high number of data points and dimensions. Okay, so the stump is pretty simple notation wise, and uh, the implementation is fairly obvious once you think about it. Now let's build on some stumps and get to some trees. But first, I'm going to uh, take a little break here because I'm going to go for that thing where we do lots of short lectures to help people kind of refocus and maintain their energy. And uh, I'll see you again in just a minute. Ciao for now.